This is another Christian use word that we take for granted. We kind of gloss over it, not really thinking about what it means. In the church, maybe we don't always do a good job of defining our vocabulary words for people. So when we think of Lord, what comes to mind? Maybe bright, shining, beautiful light. Maybe glory rays. Um, maybe we think of it as a synonym for praise. And it is all those things, but it is so much more. The Hebrew word for glory, kabod, literally means weight or heaviness. But in a positive way, like an orange tree, so heavy with fruit, the branches are at the ground. Or heavy like jewelry, heavy like gold and precious jewels. When a person has glory, um, or weightiness, the closest thing I can think in English is when we say a person has broad tops. There's a weight to them. Um, maybe we give more weight to what that person says. In modern English, we don't frequently use the word glory in secular context, but the Hebrews absolutely did. The Old Testament talks about the glory of human beings, the glory of nations, and not just the glory of God. For example, when Joseph's brothers come to Egypt and glory reveals something, Joseph reveals himself to them. He tells them, you must tell my father about all my glory in Egypt and bring him to me. So what was Joseph's glory in Egypt? Honor, a good name, a good reputation, position, wealth, fame, the total trust of Pharaoh. The Hebrew word for glory encompasses all these things. But when we read through the Bible, we tend to miss that sense of glory as reputation and fame when we are talking about the glory of the Lord. So today we're going to be focusing on two meanings of glory that we see in Scripture. Glory as reputation and glory as a manifestation of God's fullness. First, glory is reputation. In Thomas Hill, if you don't have your reputation, you don't have anything. <laughs> a while back, the minister was at the next historic <laughs> house in town that was suddenly abandoned. The owner just picked up a moat without even selling his house, just ran out of town one day, vines thrown out the side. I thought, this is weird. Then I couldn't find out. Apparently, the owner was a contractor who had done some shady business deals around town. And you know, word gets around pretty quick. It got to the point no one would work with him again or, or hire him or anything. We understand the value of reputation. And this may sound shocking, but God cares about his reputation. In Exodus, when Pharaoh finally lets his people go, and they're just going across the Red Sea, they're just almost there, God says to Moses, I will turn Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. How can God gain glory for himself through Pharaoh? I mean, he can't steal glory rays from Pharaoh and add it to himself. This isn't rainbow fish. It's clear that God is talking about his reputation. Pharaoh's army chases God's people, so God draws them out in the chase and then drowns them in the Red Sea. This is a power play on the international stage. He wants the world to see that he is stronger than Pharaoh. This isn't some sort of ego trick. Hear what it says. God does this so that the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God wants the Egyptian people to see that he alone is the true God. He is more powerful than any Pharaoh or any army. And to our modern ears, this could seem a bit shallow. Why is God concerned with his reputation? Why why would you not care what people think about him? He's God. But there's a good reason. We see this in our song for today. Help us for the glory of your name. Deliver us and forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nation say, where is their God? They are begging God, please help us. 
see God is glory, when we see God for who he is, we see some manifestation of his power, his presence, in a tangible way. And God's glory is not always a bright light that we see. Sometimes it's a way that we feel. Our own experience testifies to this concept in the Bible that glory is weight. Sometimes when we feel the presence of the Lord, sometimes we do have this feeling of heaviness. Sometimes the feeling becomes so heavy that people actually fall over. This isn't necessarily because they're having some kind of ecstatic experience that pass out. It's more like there's such a heavy weight on them that sometimes it's easier to lay down than to stay standing. God's glory is the full weight of God, the full weight of his beauty, his power, and his presence. In our gospel passage, we see both senses of your glory in one story, God's reputation and his holiness. When Jesus learns that his friend Lazarus is sick, he says, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through him. Then the passage goes on to say, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. This in case value is one of the most perplexing verses in scripture. Jesus loved his family and his son, and therefore he waited two days to go to them. He loved them and so he stayed two more days. Why? If he loved them, why wouldn't he go to them? Why wouldn't he heal Lazarus? But Jesus has already told us that this is a story of God's glory. What if I told you that Jesus waited because he was showing off? Bear with me. He was showing off God's glory. Because he waited, he revealed the maximum full force impact of God's glory. The miracle was more glorious because Lazarus was in the two more days. This is not going to just be a miracle for his friends. This was going to be the 16th chapel of miracles. When there is a death, Jewish people sit with the body in the home. If Jesus had come right away during the wait, people would say, oh, Lazarus was just mostly dead. They would have thought Jesus was like Miracle Max from the Princess Bride. Lazarus wasn't dead, just mostly dead. But after four days in a tomb, no one can say Lazarus was just mostly dead. Lazarus was all the way dead. When Jesus finally shows up, Martha displays incredible faith. She runs to Jesus and says, Lord, I know, even now, God will do whatever you ask. Even now, even after four days in the tomb, she's saying, I know you can still bring him back to me. But when Jesus comes to the tomb and tells them to roll away the stone, he and it at 12 feet. When it comes to the moment of truth, to open back up the grave, to see and smell her dead brother, even Martha loses her nerve. But Lord, he has been in there four days. There will be a bad smell. And in this valley of the shadow of death, Jesus says, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? The glory of God. In this passage, what is the glory of God? Raising the dead. Life. The glory of God is to raise the dead. Now back in Moses' time, God had to say, if I let you see the glory, you're going to be dead. Now, Jesus says, the glory of God is to raise the dead. Now, Jesus says, Martha, look here. You don't have to hide, you don't have to hide in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to open up this rock. Glory of God is to raise the dead. 
In this passage, we see the fullness of God's power unleashed. And we also see the fullness of God, who He is, who He says He is. The Lord of Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Martha got to see with her own eyes the fullness of God's glory and the fullness of God's love will be manifest. She received her brother back from the dead. And there were so many witnesses who saw this, that this news spread like wildfire. Jesus is not just a good teacher. Jesus spreads laughter from the dead on the fourth day. And this other meaning of glory, the reputation of Jesus, the fame of Jesus spread all over as a result of this miracle. And when it gets back to the Pharisees, this is what they say. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And it says, from that day on, they plotted to take his life. The Jewish leaders see the increase of Jesus' glory and reputation as a threat. This miracle of raising Lazarus is a pivotal moment in the Gospel of John. After this moment, Jesus begins his long walk to the cross. In the resurrection of Lazarus, we see this sickness was not unto death. It was for God's glory and the glory of God's Son. The Father's glory is made manifest in Jesus. The Father wanted Jesus to receive glory. He wanted people to see, this is my Son. This is the one. <coughs> Believe in him. No one else could do this miracle. There are Jesus is the fullness of God's glory. When we think about God's glory, when we think about Moses' experience, seeing him as he truly is, face to face, his face like blinding radiation, his voice like thunder, the sheer power in his presence. Basically, it's like we're being asked to have a personal relationship with a nuclear reactor. How can this even work? Hebrews 1 says this. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Moses did not see the face of God in love, but God knew we needed to see him face to face. So God became a human. Shrouded in his glory in a jar of clay. So that he could talk to us face to face. The Son of God is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being in human form. So we could finally look at him and touch him and not die. We could hear the direct voice of God and not be terrified. We could see the full glory of God in a vessel that looks like us. In Jesus' body, not only will we not die when we look upon the face of God, but through Jesus' body on the cross, we would actually be saved from death forever. Christ is the full image of God. And we are all stamped with God's image, but Jesus is the full manifestation of the image of God. And we are meant to reflect his glory in the world. If we project the false image of, of God and his glory to the world, one made in our own image, this actually damages God's reputation among the nations. This will actually drive people away. We are created to reflect God's glory. The Bible goes so far as to say, when Jesus appears in his glory and said they come, we will be like him. We will radiate his glory. Like the sun, like the, like the moon or the sun, we will be radiant like him. Today, how do we reflect God's glory? The answer is surprisingly simple. We spend time with Jesus. 2 Corinthians says, We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into this image of ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. Unveiled voices, we can gaze upon the glory of God with unveiled faces. Now that God's glory is in Jesus. When we spend time gazing upon Jesus, meditating, 
are slowly being transformed into his glorious image. Just like the face of Moses radiated after being in the presence of God, we will glow with God's glory when we spend time with Jesus. Do you know that our Exodus and John passage have a common today? God was showing off when he delayed the miracle. But when they were waiting, everything looked completely hopeless. God would have let Moses have an easy getaway. If God and Moses have said, I'm going to get through another God. Why are we going to do this? Why are we going to do this over again? Let's have a good getaway. Why don't we have a chase scene in this movie? Can we just go? And here we are today, we just want Jesus to come to heal him. The first time I've heard about this. So he didn't have to die at all. But these tragedies set the stage. For some of the greatest miracles in the Old Testament and New Testament. So great a salvation. So great a rescue. You might be going through something in your life, something looking bleak. Fear is only approaching, and your back's pressed up against the wall. The death of a loved one. A marriage on the rocks. Relapse into addiction or depression. But the bleaker the situation, the greater God's glory when he reaches out and rescues us. Maybe the situation is not unto death, but for the glory of God to be displayed. If the tomb of all the tells us anything, no situation is too far on. Where is the tomb of Lazarus in your life? Cry out to Jesus, I know now, even now, Jesus, you can do it. And even if we don't see the dead race, even the worst tragedies can set the same surety of God's glory, God's redemption, God's hope in the world. So we cry out, God, help us. Lord, show us your glory. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.